Chapter 10. Our first night, under canvas, an appeal for help, contrariness of tea kettles, how to overcome, supper, how to feel virtuous, wanted, a comfortably appointed, well-drained desert island, neighborhood of South Pacific Ocean preferred, funny thing that happened to George's father, a restless night. Harris and I began to think that Bell Weir Lock must have been done away with after the same manner. George had towed us up to Staines, and we had taken the boat from there, and it seemed that we were dragging 50 tons after us, and were walking 40 miles. It was half, pa half past seven when we were through, and we all got in and sculled up close to the left bank, looking out for a spot to haul up in. We'd originally intended to go on to Magna Carta Island, a sweetly pretty part of the river where it winds through a soft green valley, and to camp in one of the many picturesque inlets to be found round that tiny shore. But somehow we did not feel that we yearned for the picturesque nearly so much now as we had earlier in the day. A bit of water between a coal barge and a gas works would have quite satisfied us for that night. We did not want scenery. We wanted to have our supper and go to bed. However, we did pull up to the point, picnic point it is called, and dropped into a very pleasant nook under a great elm tree to the spreading roots of which we fastened the boat. Then we thought we were going to have supper. We had dispensed with tea so as to save time. But George said no, that we had better get the canvas up first before it got quite dark and while we could see what we were doing. Then, he said, all our work would be done and we could sit down to eat with an easy mind. That canvas wanted more putting up than I think any of us had bargained for. It looked so simple in the abstract. You took five iron arches like gigantic croquet hoops and fitted them up over the boat and then stretched the canvas over them and fastened it down. It would take quite ten minutes, we thought. That was an underestimate. We took up the hoops and began to drop them into the sockets placed for them. You would not imagine this to be dangerous work, but, looking back now, the wonder to me is that any of us are alive to tell the tale. They were not hoops, they were demons. First, they would not fit into their sockets at all, and we had to jump on them and kick them and hammer at them with the boat hook, and when they were in, it turned out that they were the wrong ho hoops for those particular sockets, and they had to come out again. But they would not come out until two of us had gone and struggled with them for five minutes when they would jump up suddenly and try to throw us into the water and drown us. They had hinges in the middle, and when we were not looking, they nipped us with these hinges in delicate parts of the body, and while we were wrestling with one side of the poop the in and endeavoring to persuade it to do its duty, the other side would come behind us in a cowardly manner and hit us over the head. We got them fixed at last, and then all that was to be done was to arrange the covering over them. George unrolled it and fastened one end over the nose of the boat. Harris stood in the middle to take it from George and roll it on to me, and I kept by the stern to receive it. It was a long time coming down to me. George did his part all right, but it was new work to Harris, and he bungled it. How he managed it, I do not know. He could not explain it himself, but by some mysterious process or other, he succeeded, after ten minutes of superhuman effort, and getting himself completely rolled up in it. He was so firmly wrapped round and tucked in and folded over that he could not get out. He, of course, made frantic struggles for freedom, the birthright of every Englishman, and in doing so, I learned this afterwards, knocked over George, and then George, swearing at Harris, began to struggle too and got himself entangled and rolled up. I knew nothing about the, all this at the time. I did not understand the business at all myself. I had been told to stand where I was and wait till the canvas came to me, and Montmorency and I stood there and waited both as good as gold. We could see the canvas being violently jerked and tossed about pretty considerably, but we supposed this was part of the method and did not interfere. We also heard much smothered language coming from underneath it, and we guessed that they were finding the job rather troublesome, and concluded that we would wait until things had got a little simpler before we joined in. We waited some time, but matters seemed to only get more and more involved, until at last George's head came wriggling out over the side of the boat and spoke up. It said, Give us a hand here, can't you, you cuckoo, standing there like a stuffed mummy, when you see we are both being suffocated, you dummy? 
I never could withstand an appeal for help, so I went and undid them, not before it was time, either, for Harris was nearly black in the face. It took us half an hour's hard labor after that before it was properly up, and then we cleared the decks and got out supper. We put the kettle on to boil, up in the nose of the boat, and went down to the stern and pretended to take no notice of it, but set to work to get the other things out. That is the only way to get a co kettle to boil up the river. If it sees that you are waiting for it and are anxious, it will never even sing. You have to go away and begin your meal as if you were not going to have any tea at all. You must not even look round at it. Then you will soon hear it sputtering away, mad to be made into tea. It is a good plan, too, if you are in a great hurry, to talk very loudly to each other about how you don't need any tea and are not going to have any. You get near the kettle so that it can overhear you, and then you shout out, I don't want any tea, do you, George? To which George shouts back, oh no, I don't like tea. We'll have lemonade instead. Tea's so indigestible. Upon which the kettle boils over and puts the stove out. We adopted this harmless bit of trickery, and the result was that, by the time everything else was ready, the tea was waiting. Then we lit the lantern and squatted down to supper. We wanted that supper. For five and thirty minutes, not a sound was heard throughout the length and breadth of that boat, save the clank of cutlery and crockery and the steady grinding of four sets of molars. At the end of five and thirty minutes, Harrison, ah, and took his left leg out from under him and put his right one there and said, Five minutes afterwards, George said, ah, two, and threw his plate out on the bank, and three minutes later than that, Montmorency gave the first sign of contentment he had exhibited since we had started, and rolled over on his side and spread his legs out. And then I said, ah, and bent my head back and bumped it against one of the hoops, but I did not mind it. I did not even swear. How good one feels when one is full, how satisfied with ourselves and with the world. People who have tried it tell me that a clear conscience makes you very happy and contented, but a full stomach does the business quite as well. And it is cheaper and more easily obtained. One feels so forgiving and generous after a substantial and well-digested meal, so noble-minded, so kindly-hearted. It is very strange, this domination of our intellect by our digestive organs. We cannot work, we cannot think, unless our stomach wills so. It dictates to us our emotions, our passions. After eggs and bacon, it says, work. After beefsteak and porter, it says, sleep. After a cup of tea, two spoons full, spoons full for each cup, and don't let it stand more than three minutes, it says to the brain, now rise and show your strength. Be eloquent and deep and tender. See with a clear eye into nature and into life. Spread your white wings of quivering thought and soar a godlike spirit over the whirling world beneath you, up through long lanes of flaming stars to the gates of eternity. After hot muffins, it says, be dull and soulless, like a beast of the field, a brainless animal with listless eye, unlit by any ray of fancy or of hope or fear or love or life. And after brandy, take in a sufficient quantity, it says, now come, fool, grin and tumble, that your fellow men may laugh, drivel in folly and sputter in senseless sounds, and show what a helpless ninny is poor man whose wit and will are drowned like kittens side by side in half an inch of alcohol. We are but the veriest, sorriest slaves of our stomach. Reach not after morality and righteousness, my friends. Watch vigilantly your stomach and diet it with care and judgment. Then virtue and contentment will come and reign within your heart, unsought by any effort of your own, and you will be a good citizen, a loving husband, and a tender father, a noble, pious man. Before our supper, Harris and George and I were quarrelsome and snappy and ill-tempered. After our supper, we sat and beamed on one another, and we beamed upon the dog, too. We loved each other. We loved everybody. Harris, in moving about, trod upon George's corn. Had this happened before supper, George would have expressed wishes and desires concerning Harris's fate in this world and the next that would have made a thoughtful man shudder. As it was, he said, Steady, old man. Where? Wheat? 
And Harris, instead of merely observing in his most unpleasant tones that a fellow could hardly help treading on some bit of George's foot if he had to move about at all within ten yards of where George was sitting, suggested that George never ought to come into an ordinary-sized boat with feet that length, and advising him to hang over the side as he would have done before supper, now said, Oh, I'm so sorry, old chap. I hope I haven't hurt you. And George said, Not at all. That it was his fault, and Harris said, No, it was his. It was quite pretty to hear them. We lit our pipes and sat, looking out on the quiet night, and talked. George said, Why could not we be always like this, away from the world with its sin and temptation, leading sober, peaceful lives and doing good? I said it was the sort of thing I had often longed for myself, and we discussed the possibility of are going away, we four, to some handy, well-fitted desert island and living there in the woods. Harris said that the danger about desert islands, as far as he had heard, was that they were so damp, but George said no, not if properly drained. And then we got onto drains, and that put George in mind of a very funny thing that had happened to his father once. He said his father was traveling with another man through Wales. And one night they stopped at a little inn where there were some other fellows, and they joined the other fellows and spent the evening with them. They had a very jolly evening and sat up late, and by the time they came to go to bed, they, this was when George's father was a very young man, were slightly jolly too. They, George's father and George's father's friend, were to sleep in the same room, but in different beds. They took the candle and went up. The candle lurched up against the wall when they got into the room and went out, and they had to undress and grope into bed in the dark. This they did, but instead of getting into separate beds, as they thought they were doing, they both climbed into the same one without knowing it, one getting in with his head at the top and the other crawling in from the opposite side of the compass and lying with his feet on the pillow. There was silence for a moment, and then George's father said, Joe! What's the matter, Tom? replied Joe's voice from the other end of the bed. Why, there's a man in my bed, said George's father. Here's his feet on my pillow. Well, it's an extraordinary thing, Tom, answered the other, but I'm blessed if there isn't a man in my bed, too. What are you going to do, asked George's father. Well, I'm going to chuck him out, replied Joe. So am I, said George's father valiantly. There was a brief struggle, followed by two heavy bumps on the floor, and then a rather doleful voice said, I say, Tom, yes, have you got on? Well, to tell the truth, my man's chucked me out. So's mine. I don't think v much of this inn, do you? What's the name of this inn? said Harris. The pig and whistle, said George. Why? Ah, oh, no, then it isn't the same, replied Harris. What do you mean, queried George. Why, it's so curious, murmured Harris. But precisely that very same thing happened to my father once in a country inn. I've often heard him tell the tale. I thought it might be the same inn. We turned in at ten that night, and I thought I should sleep well being tired, but I didn't. As a rule, I undress and put my head on the pillow, and then somebody bangs at the door and says it's half past eight, but tonight everything seemed against me. The novelty of it all, the hardness of the boat, the cramped position, I was lying with my feet under one seat and my head on another. The sound of the lapping water around the boat and the wind among the branches kept me restless and disturbed. I did get to sleep for a few hours, and then some part of the boat which seemed to have grown up in the night, for it certainly was not there when we started, and it disappeared by the morning, kept digging into my spine. I slept through it for a while, dreaming that I had swallowed a sovereign, and that they were cutting a hole in my back with a gimlet so as to try and get it out. I thought it very unkind of them, and I told them I would owe them the money, and they should have it at the end of the month. But they would not hear of that and said it would be much better if they had it then, because otherwise the interest would accumulate so. I got quite cross with them after a bit and told them what I thought of them, and then they gave me the gimlet, gave the gimlet such an excruciating wrench that I woke up. The boat seemed stuffy and my head ached, so I thought I would step out into the cool night air. I slipped on what clothes I could find about, some of my own and some of George's and Harris's, and crept under the canvas onto the bank. It was a glorious night. The moon had sunk and left the quiet earth alone with the stars. It seemed as if, in the silence and the hush, while we, we, her children, slept, they were talking with her, their sister, conversing of mighty mysteries in voices too vast and deep for childish human ears to catch the sound. 
They awe us, these strange stars, so cold, so clear. We are as children whose small feet have strayed into some dim-lit temple of the god they have been taught to worship but know not. And standing where the echoing, echoing dome spans the long vista of the shadowy light, glance up, half hoping, half afraid to see some awful vision hovering there. And yet it seems so full of comfort and of strength, the night. In its great presence, our small sorrows creep away ashamed. The day has been so full of fret and care, and our hearts have been so full of evil and of bitter thoughts, and the world has seemed so hard and wrong to us. Then night, like some great loving mother, gently lays her hand upon our fevered head and turns our little tear-stained face up to hers and smiles, and though she does not speak, we know what she would say, and lay our hot flushed cheek against her bosom, and the pain is gone. Sometimes our pain is very deep and real, and we stand before her very silent, because there is no language for our pain, only a moan. Night's heart is full of pity for us. She cannot ease our aching. She takes our hand in hers, and the little world grows very small and very far away beneath us, and borne upon her dark wings, we pass for a moment into a mightier presence than her own. And in the wondrous light of that great presence, all human life lies like a book before us, and we know that pain and sorrow are but the angels of God. Only those who have worn the crown of suffering can look upon that wondrous light, and they, when they return, may not speak of it or tell the majesty they know. Once upon a time, through a strange country, there rode some goodly knights, and their path lay by a deep wood where tangled briars grew very thick and strong and tore the flesh of them that lost their way therein. And the leaves of the trees that grew in the wood were very dark and thick, so that no ray of light came through the branches to lighten the gloom and sadness. And as they passed by that dark wood, one night of those that rode, missing his comrades, wandered far away and returned to them no more. And they, sorely grieving, rode on without him, mourning him as one dead. Now, when they reached the fair castle towards which they had been journeying, they stayed there many days and made merry. And one night, as they sat in cheerful ease around the logs that burned in the great hall and drank a loving measure, there came the comrade they had lost and greeted him, the, them. His clothes were ragged, like a beggar's, and many sad wounds were on his sweet flesh, but on his face there shone a great radiance of deep joy. And they questioned him, asking what had befallen him, and he told them how in the dark wood he had lost his way, and had wandered many days and nights, till, torn and bleeding, he had laid him down to die. Then when he was nigh unto death, lo, through the savage gloom there came to him a stately maiden, and took him by the hand, and led him on through devious paths unknown to any man until upon the darkness of the world there dawned a light, such as the light of day was unto, but as a little lamp unto the sun. And in that wondrous light our way-worn night saw as in a dream of vision, and so glorious, so fair the vision seemed, that of his bleeding wounds he thought no more, but stood as one entranced, whose joy is deep as is the sea, where of no man can tell the depth. And the vision faded, and the night, kneeling upon the ground, thanked a good saint who into that sad wood had strayed his steps so he'd seen the vision that lay there ahead. And the name of the dark forest was Sorrow, but of the vision that the good knight saw therein we may not speak nor tell.